The Day of Atonement. Lesson 4. Holiness 1. Are there any questions from last time? Basically, we saw that, uh, well, let's see, why we, were at, we got to verse 19 in 2 Corinthians uh, 5. Why don't we just uh, finish up that? And, and there are many such verses such as this that relate to our reconciliation. Uh, we were in 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, we began at 17, but um, why, don't, why don't I begin there? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In other words, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And if you, if you find that there are areas that, uh, that are still old, that haven't become new yet, then rejoice because uh, you have yet before you the Day of Atonement in, in those regards, in those aspects. And so, um, you know, when the Lord encourages us to the fullness of reconciliation... Uh, it, it's not done to make us feel badly or that he's better than we are or we're somehow off-scouring, off-cast. But the purpose is to bring us to join with him. See, re being reconciled, just like if, if two neighbors are quarreling, when they're reconciled, they're at peace with each other. They rejoice in each other. They're, they have the same plans, the same goals. They are part. So there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing present that is antagonistic one toward another. Then you are reconciled. And it's the same way with the Lord. And so the Lord continually calls us to higher ground uh, as this process of reconciliation uh, proceeds. All things have become new, and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And, and by that, this means that you play a part in others being reconciled to the Lord, not just simply seeing to it that they have an initial relationship to the Lord Jesus, but also to play a role See, there's a ministry of reconciliation, and that is to play a role in encouraging others to be joined more firmly in Jesus Christ. Because, uh, you see this in Ephesians, for example, where it says that the whole body is perfectly joined together by that which every joint supplies. And you are a part of the body. And what you provide the, is the, that which is necessary for the whole body to be joined together which is the process of reconciliation. It's the building of a, of a temple, a place for God to dwell completely. It's the, this, the completion of the fullness of the stature that is, uh, that is in Jesus Christ. And we don't see that yet. And so that tells us for the church in these days that the process of reconciliation has not been brought to its fullness. But shall, it shall, before the Lord comes. To wit, uh, that is, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing their trespasses unto them. And that's important. When you come to the Lord, he does not impute your trespasses to you. They are forgiven. And he does so so that you can start this process of reconciliation on an even keel. Because otherwise we would, we would just simply be undone. And we'll get into that because... One temptation, <clears throat> as you press toward the mark, toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, as described in Philippians 3, it's awfully tempting to become negative and morose and introspective. And, uh, and that is not part of the process. The part of the process is, to, is for, the, for your rejoicing to be full. Uh... not imputing their trespasses, uh, trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And what, what, what's our message if we are ambassadors? What's the, uh, we are messengers of a king from another kingdom, living in a foreign land, Hmm? And what is the good news? 
In in what regard here? There's, see, there's a there's a specific. The word it's the word of reconciliation, and see, this is amplified. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, <clears throat> as though God did beseech you by us. In other words, Paul saying, I "I'm telling you this, but this is really the Lord." We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. This is Paul talking to the Corinthian church. Be reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us. There's no reason why you can't proceed. He made him sin for us. See, this is why it's the Day of Atonement. And that's why the blood of Jesus Christ is so prominent during this process. The way has been made for you to be fully reconciled to God. And it's because he was made sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that's, that's the issue, being made the righteousness of God in him. Not in word, but in actual behavior. Something that demonstrates that this new creation is alive and well and is strong and dominant and it has its own fruit it's gentle it doesn't lie it's not bossy it's not arrogant it's meek humble peaceable lovers of that which is good doesn't boast itself that's what this new nature is like the other thing arrogance pride hatred lasciviousness that's the old creation that's Adam Praise the Lord. Any questions on this so far? Don't want to rush headlong. Okay. Now, God gave two commandments to the Jews of old concerning the Day of Atonement that underscores this dilemma that we've been outlining. One is that he says, you shall afflict your souls. Remember that? And how, uh, how did we explain that the Jews today interpret that? Fasting. By fasting. In other words, the soul being part of the worldly uh, human uh, uh, life uh, needs food in order to thrive and so to them it, it is prudent on this day that you not let your soul you know set one day aside where your soul does not make its demands that, that you deny your soul that which produces life for it in exchange for what? in exchange for something which produces another kind of life. So, and that's why, that's why a good Jew will not live in the soul, so to speak, uh, during all times during the year. But he makes sure that his sights are on things that are higher, because there's a higher life. There is something else besides being alive in, uh, in the flesh. So that was the first thing. Afflict your souls. But at the same time, he says, you shall do no servile work. Both are a commandment. Now, we could be legalistic and say, fasting, therefore, is works. Couldn't we? Say, and what, ha what happens to you as soon as you say, and I'm, I'm trying to reason with you the way the flesh reasons, what do you do immediately as soon as you say, but fasting is works, and works have no place here? Why do we shoot ourselves in the foot, to use an old cowboy expression? Sure, they contradict each other. The, the commandment is afflict your souls and don't do any work. And so once we say that fasting is work, we automatically make sure we disobey God. 
because in keeping the don't work side of it, we abuse the afflict your soul side of it. Can you see that? Some do, some don't. Okay. And that's precisely what we've done with the New Testament. By taking the idea, you shall do no servile work, see, not of works lest any man shall boast, and applying it directly toward the very things that God commands us to do in the New Testament, we shoot ourselves in the foot. It's a, it's a blunder. It's a big mistake because we thereby insist that we not obey God. We thereby insist that we will not follow the New Testament and its commandments. We design that into the New Testament. Whereas what we need to do is to explore this tension that's brought about by, on one hand, being required to do something, and yet on the other hand, not ever <clears throat> allowing ourselves to be in a place as though somehow we're in the driver's seat and Jesus, uh, Jesus does our bidding or, or uh, has to do something because we're doing the right thing, which is, uh, which is not the case at all. So that's, that's the dilemma of modern Bible-believing Christianity. How is it that you are able to obey God and yet at the same time you are not working? Well, it's, it's not as hard as, uh, as you'd think. In fact, we've kind of thrown the baby out with the dirty wash water with our refusal to practice righteousness because the commandment to practice righteousness is from cover to cover in the New Testament. And that's what I'd like to explore with you. That to keep present in your mind that we have two things before us. One, we are called to afflict ourselves, in a sense. We're to deny the source of strength and life of a, of a part, of a component of our personality. And at the same time, we are to acknowledge God's place in all of this. And the New Testament is the description of how these two processes are consistent and work together. It is. That's, that's what its very presence is. But once you rule one of them out because you fasten on the other, you destroy the New Testament and make it impossible for you other than by God's mercy. And I, and I, think, he, I think he is merciful. I believe God has enormous mercy toward the ignorant. Uh, especially we who are taught. See, we trust our teachers, don't we? And if we are taught that, uh, that you, are, you have no calling to participate in, this, uh, in the growth of this new creature, uh, that there's nothing that you can do to... Uh, assist by cooperative efforts with the Holy Spirit. See, if you're taught that, then I believe that the penalty pretty much falls on the shoulders of those who did the teaching. In fact, it says in James they receive double. Double. And unfortunately, the sad part is, is that uh, I believe God will have mercy, but nonetheless the fruit still is not born this fruit is still not manifested and correspondingly many will be saved even so as by fire. They'll be saved, all right. But they will barely make it and that because Jesus loved them and has found sufficient reason to save them because he's generous. He's, when Jesus goes to discard a soul, when he does so, it, you can be assured that there is nothing worth saving in that soul. It is without any redemptive value at all. And I believe if he, if he sees something there of value to save, and that thing of value is his own presence in some sort of regard, then the rest goes. It's like uh, taking a rotten banana and, and finding that one part of it that hasn't been rotted and... And at least getting a morsel, <laughs> throwing everything away, at least getting a morsel. So that's better than uh, having the whole thing heaved, obviously. So let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, let, why don't we look at Romans chapter 2.
And I'd like to go through the Gospels with you. I'm beginning with the Gospels simply to help focus on, in this case, Paul, who is ill-reputed to have said that you do not have to behave righteously. Paul never said that. But somehow we have taken his teachings to, uh, to say that it's okay, you can live as you want because, uh, because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And so I want to be sure that we emphasize uh, what Paul wrote as well as uh, other, uh, other New Testament books, uh, Hebrews and James and First uh, John and Jude and, uh, and some of the others, to show that this thinking is, uh, is entirely absent from, uh, from the writings of, uh, of Paul or for anyone else. And by the way, one place where it is dominantly missing from is what Jesus has to say about the gospel. So you cannot find in anything that Jesus says other than one place like perhaps where he says, uh, this is in John, I think, chapter 6 or thereabouts, where they came to him and what, what do we have to do to do the works of God? And he said, believe only. That and maybe one or two others that leaves the impression that all you have to do is believe in nothing else, uh, which is not the sense of that. The sense of that is if you all, all you have to do is believe, and out of that belief, your choices and your actions will be conformed to be obeying God and 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 serving Him. That that's the implication there, uh, because it's James explains it's no big deal to believe. The devils believe, so it's not just believing. It's the fact that when you believe you set your mind to purposes at hand. And if you believe that Jesus is the Savior, then you will serve that purpose and your behavior will change because of what you believe. It so. sounds like they were perverting the gospel way back then. They were perverting the gospel. <laughs> James, they have to write that. That's right. Yes, that's right. And uh, we'll look at some of these. But other than that, you'll find Jesus repeatedly saying... It's what you do. He almost says, I don't care what you say so much. I'm paraphrasing, and I'll tell you uh, where he does this. It's more important what it is that you do. Let me give you an example. He said, um, I want you to consider two sons. One son was told by his father to, uh, to work in the field, and he said, no way. But afterwards, he thought about it and said, whoops, I had better do what Papa says, and he went and worked. Then the second son, the father said, go work in the field, and he said, why, of course, but he never went. And the question Jesus asked, which of these two sons is justified? And the answer is the one that actually did it. Now notice, he didn't say yes, he did it thereby confirming the real yes in his heart. The one that said yes cut no ice because of the lack of confirmation by his behavior. And so what is more important to the Christian is not so much what is coming out of your mouth, but what are you confirming by your behavior? Yes, no, yes, no, that isn't quite the issue. The issue is, what are you saying by your works, by how you behave? That's how you tell if someone's saying, yes, Lord, or no, Lord. And didn't Jesus say, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you say Lord, Lord, and not do what I ask you to do? So if you look in the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus constantly emphasized the doing of his will. And not just this talk, you know, I'll say yes, but, you know, deep in my heart, I'll really, uh, uh, I really know it's okay. It's all right if I say yes and plan, kind of play the game, because Jesus will forgive me, and I don't have to show out of my behavior anything. How about, the, how about the man with the talent, the one talent? He showed by his behavior he was unwilling to trust his master. He was unwilling to, to take that treasure which was committed to him. It was his behavior. 
And Jesus agreed with his speech. <clears throat> and the man said, well, I knew you were hard and you reap what you didn't sow and all this. And Jesus said, you knew that. So he agreed with them in, in doctrine. He said, you should have at least have done something. You, you could have at least given it away or put it in the bank so at least it would have, I would have gotten something on it. So it's very, very difficult in the teachings of Jesus to find anything but this incredible emphasis on your conduct being the ultimate umpire. Your conduct as well as your words. You will, every word we uttered, we have, we'll have to explain why we said that. That's right. So it isn't so much belief. It's the way you live. And that is also confirmed in the writings of Paul and the other apostles. There is no difference. There is no disparity between what Jesus says in the Gospels. Although, you read the scholars, you read the, the um, what do you call those things, um, Commentaries, you read the commentaries, and there's a direct implication that somehow Paul had to write things differently in order to correct the, uh, the mis leaving a wrong impression that the Gospels leave. Wow. Wow. In fact, there's a doctrine that, that, that explains that what Jesus said was really for the, only for the Jews. And was before the cross and therefore is, is, is of no effect today. And then that it's the writings of Paul that is the New Testament. None of which is true. Because the New Testament itself says the New Testament cannot be written with uh, pen and ink. So these letters, these words you have before you, even that isn't the New Testament. It's a rep it represents the New Testament. It's the spirit. It's, it's an explanation of the New Testament. Just as an instruction manual is an explanation of the of say something that you own, some instrument, and explains how it works and what it is, and you 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 know the, the instruction manual can't be confused with the real thing. Yeah, say like an automobile the, or a tractor, the the instruction manual on how to operate a tractor, you can't plow without instruction manual. You have to have the tractor. It's the same with the gospel. The gospel itself can only be written in your heart. The instruction manual says so. And so the instruction manual itself is not the gospel. It's an explanation of it. And, and we revere it. We believe it. We don't fool around with it. But then on the other hand, we don't try to make it um, something that it is not. We don't try to make it a, a new set of laws uh, to accept or reject based on, uh, on on our thinking. I was speaking with um, uh, a diligent young man who was uh, uh, of intellectual s sort, and I brought up uh, 1 John 1, 9, which is something we'll be decidedly getting into here because it's part of the process of overcoming sin. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, those are those two goats. One is slain for forgiveness, the other is driven out for uh, cleansing. And even before I could uh, explain what I uh, was probing for by announcing it as a scripture, he says, wait a minute, he says, you don't understand, this scripture was written because of the of Gnosticism that was prevalent in that day and was written to do away with that argument. And, and therefore, it doesn't apply today. In other words, because it was present there to answer a present-day argument uh, of, of, of these uh, folks called Gnostics, uh, it did so, but it has no further value today. Now, notice, notice there are two things that happen here. One is, in order to understand that, you have to be a scholar. You have to, be, you have, to have volumes of books on history to discover that there was a group called the Gnostics, uh, understand their doctrine, and then... Uh, and then somehow surmise, and I'm not sure how you would do this, that this one verse is the answer to their argument. And what 
displeases me about this whole business, it means, it means you have to go to a seminary, a theological seminary, in order to understand the scriptures. And that cannot be. The gospel has to be understood by easily, simply by every man, woman, boy, and girl, regardless of their intellectual capability. In fact, the Bible implies very directly that the, the, the more mental capability you have, the less likely you're going to really grasp the significance in the New Testament. That's the first thing I didn't like about it. You, 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 have, to, you have to find some other source of fact. Of, you have to find some other source of truth in order to understand the Bible. I don't like that. That, that makes me nervous. The second thing I don't like about it is that, therefore, it, and this is what you have to do in order to preserve some of the major uh, uh, Bible-believing uh, church doctrines today, this is the second thing you have to do. You have to say, this does not belong in the Bible, or this doesn't apply today. There's something wrong with this. This isn't good anymore. You have to be able to throw major portions of the Bible away. If, if we are not going to pursue holiness and be reconciled to the Lord, you have to, you have to do something with these masses of Scripture that's, that say quite plainly to the otherwise. And so that was his answer. It is no longer a verse today. It's, it's not, it has no power today. It's, it's, it, has, it has no meaning. And some way or another, that's one thing that you have to do is to... Uh, disannul the scripture. And it's interesting that this is the technique used dominantly by Bible-believing Christians. Is to segment the Bible and say, well, that's not for today. Or this other reason or that. Uh, Matthew 24 is one of my favorite examples where the explanation is because Matthew 24 um, defies uh, much of... Uh, modern uh, Christians' understanding of the coming of the Lord. And so to explain, uh, to explain the way around this is to say, well, uh, the Matthew 24 is Jewish ground. Well, a phrase I've never, you know, where did this come from? What is Jewish ground? But the implication, you can see the implication. The implication it doesn't really apply. It's, uh, it applies somewhere else, some other time, some other people, but not today to me. So therefore, the, the scriptures are not for me today. And where do, you, uh, where do you cease this uh, uh, dividing the word and only pulling out that which applies? And you can see immediately what, what happens is that you only pull out what applies in your own framework. In other words, you say, this is what I want to believe, and then you find those verses that, that imply that, and then you're home. You're home free. And you shoot yourself in the foot. Because in so doing, you actually defy the very sense of the scriptures that you're cutting and pasting from. We use the term cutting and pasting because of the concept of what you, what you have to do is to take the scriptures and cut around that portion that you like and then paste it in your, in your own set. Because you, can't ha you, can't, you don't dare leave uh, some of these things being present. Fortunately, I believe in these days the Lord is restoring what was lost in the time of the apostles is just simply being restored and so we have gone through our dark ages of Christian understanding and what we have had through these thousands of years two thousand years are glimpses partial glimpses of the understanding of the gospel and now the Lord is kind of taking off the blinders of our eyes and, and we're beginning to see that the gospel is much more powerful, much richer than we have ever known. So that's, that's what's happening. Okay, well, let's begin with Romans chapter 2. So that's why I'm beginning with Romans rather than uh, uh, going so much through the gospels. I would I'd encourage you to go through the gospels on your own and, uh, and confirm to what extent Jesus requires that behavior confirm your... Uh, your posture uh, toward uh, toward him. Okay, uh, Romans chapter two. Uh, let's start at verse uh, one. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are that judges, for wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you that judges does the same thing. 
In other words, Paul's view is, look, if you're doing the same thing as someone else and you're judging them, you're, that's just a bunch of hot air. There's nothing, there's nothing there at all. And notice, the comp- see, you cannot, you cannot say, look, you're a, you're a drunken bum, you're a sinner destined to hell, and at the same time, if you are living the same way, there's no excuse for that. In other words, if they're a drunken bum destined to hell, and you're a drunken bum too, then you share. You, you share. You're doing the same thing. You share the uh, the same judgment. Uh, let's, let's see if this if that survive if that concept I gave you survives as we, as we proceed through here. It's made clear. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Notice the defiant disregard toward belief and doctrine. It's the committing of things. And do you think this, O oh man, that judges them which do such things, and you do the same, that you shall accept the judgment of God? And what's the modern-day uh, Bible-believing Christian's answer? Why, of course. Why, why of course. Is, is that what Paul is driving at here? Is, is Paul pre- beginning an argument here saying, but it, boys, it's really okay if you do the same thing. Because of the grace and mercy in Jesus Christ, it's all right. It's all right. I want you to know it's all right. But see, that's what we have gleaned from Romans. And what I'm telling you, it's not there. That argument is not there. The, the opposite argument is there. It's like, whoa, you know, you can't do this. You, you can't say that they're wrong, meaning the unsaved, and you do the same thing, and that it's okay, and that God's not going to judge you and reward you the same way. Is that what you were appealing to? And I think, I think Paul instinctively felt how his uh, doctrine of grace would be per, uh, perverted, and I'm sure the Holy Spirit knew it was going to be perverted, and so saw to it that uh, uh, that the Scriptures bore a clear testimony. Can, can that be? Can that be any clearer? Uh, Romans two uh, three. And do you think this, O man, that judges them which do such things and do the same? That you shall escape the judgment of God? Do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? In other words, the reason why God, you know, God is really gentle toward us. He does not slap us down every time we we curse or every time we say something that's wrong or lie or cheat or steal or gossip or any such thing. He, he is gentle and forbearing. Why is he so forbearing? Why is he so long-suffering? Why does he give us so much of his goodness? What's, what's the purpose of it? Well, one thing would be to suggest it's his way of signaling us that really is okay. But what's another answer? To give you the opportunity to, to, give you the opportunity to save. See, he's, he's giving you manipulating room. He's giving me manipulating room. See, the, the forbearance of, don't you know, <laughs> Paul is saying to the, to the Christians at Rome, don't you know that his forbearance is to give you the opportunity to repent, to quit this? And the reason why this is important in the gospel is because holiness is required. Holiness is not an option. And by holiness I mean a a level of conduct of behavior that is devoid of anything that is demonic or unclean. Anything that resembles the world, the flesh, or the devil. Gone. That's what holiness is. And uh, the argument here is that, wow, you know, don't take the goodness of God as, as license. Realize it, that he's so kind and gentle to give you a way out. So that you can say, now, Lord, I'm wrong. I'm wrong in what I'm doing. I want to change. But 
after your hardness and impenitent in heart. See, a heart that won't change. Even a, even a heart that claims that the grace of God excuses him, that heart needs to change. Because that, that it is incorrect that the grace of God permits the Christian not to become a new creature, permits a Christian to continue in adultery and fornication. It does not. It does not. But after the hardness and impenitent in heart, treasure up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, one way of countering that would be to say, oh, well, Paul is talking about the unsaved only. He's not talking about everybody. Isn't that, a good, uh, isn't that be a good argument? To say, well, let me explain this. See, I'm a, a Bible scholar, and I've been through school, and so I can tell you that this verse does not apply to every man. It only applies to them ungodly sinners out there doesn't apply to the ungodly sinners in the church. What's wrong with that argument? Next the next verse. <laughs> so you have to cut that out. You have to cut it out and paste it someplace else. Who will render to every man according to his beliefs, according to his doctrine, it's according to his deeds, isn't it? According to his deeds. It needs to be underlined. Well, let's see... Let's see if this is characterized any further this way. Now, this, can you imagine that this is Romans? This is the book where we get our doctrine of grace from. Wow. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing. Now, does that sound like behavior or does that sound like belief? Patient continuance in well-doing. That's, that's, see, patient continuance in well-doing is, it demonstrates that what you believe is important is right behavior. So this is, if someone continues in well-doing, see, the doing well is, is how you act, what you say, what you do. Why does someone do that? Seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. What do we then conclude is the fruit or the result of patient continuance in well-doing? Eternal life, as well as glory and honor and immortality. What do we suggest, therefore, is the fruit of not patiently continuing in well-doing, or impatiently continuing well-doing, or patiently continuing evil-doing, or any other such aberration of this. No glory, no honor, no immortality, and no eternal life. See, when, when, you, when you are growing in Christ, see, this is not, this concept of the gospel is not meant for the babe in Christ. It's not meant for the one... See, Jesus catches the fish first, and then, then, he, then he cleans it. You can't clean the fish and then catch it. And so, it's important, however, sometimes we peddle the gospel a little too softly in order to do, catch a great big catch. And it's not bad for people to know that, by and large, their behavior has to change. See, and, and you hear this in things like repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Say. So, the reality of it doesn't hit us until later. But the subscription to it should occur as soon, as early in the Christian life as possible. Your agreement. You say, now Lord, as far as I'm concerned, my old life is over. You have permission to do whatever you will with this vessel. Clean it, make it a vessel to honor, a vessel to dishonor. That's not my worry. It's your worry. You do as you please. And then the expectation that God himself will, will do that. That is someone who is, who is genuinely saved, who realizes that holiness is a required portion of the Christian life. It's not optional. 
even though to begin with it might leave the impression that it's optional, it isn't. Well, let's see if it's fair to turn this scripture over uh, for those who don't uh, uh, by patient continuance and well-doing. Let's see. Verse 8. But unto them that are contentious, see, that's, uh, that's an impatient soul, and do not obey the truth, See, they're not, uh, they're not uh, continuing in well-doing, are they? But obey righteousness, indignation, and wrath. Are we still making our list? Yeah, it's like a few more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what are we up to? Uh, I'm not, I'm to 11, I've got 12. 12 now. Uh, <laughs> indignation and wrath. Now, to... Uh, and, and, now notice that that scripture doesn't end there. There's, there's a comma there. At least there is in mine. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now, if we are not careful, we'll respond to this by saying, by inserting another verse here that says, uh, we are um, dead in our sins. We are, our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's no one, there's none righteous, no, not one. See, that would be the opportunity to say that and get this burden off of us. Say, and say, well, what Paul is doing, he's appealing to us, uh, telling us that we're sinners and that we need to be sinners saved by grace. See, that would be dandy. Unfortunately, that's not what he says next. See, what he says next is, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good. Now, either he's preaching works or he's preaching some other gospel. He's not preaching works. He's not preaching another gospel. He's preaching the real gospel. And the real gospel says... Tribulation and anguish and indignation and wrath upon every soul that does evil and glory and honor and peace to every man that works good. Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter, everybody. And the reason is because God is consistent. He doesn't have one set of standards for one group of people and another set of standards for another group of people. To some he gave the law and he judged them by the law. I'm not confusing it with that. But, but we cannot take the gospel and say... God requires less of us than he does the unwashed. We cannot say that. In fact, if anything, all we can say is that God requires more. Because what can they do? A dog barks because it's a dog. A sinner sins because it's a sin. Because a sinner sins because he's a sinner. But a, a Christian should portray this salt, this light, this grace, this mercy, this glory, and this honor, he should portray it in his life. It should be shining for all, for all the world to see. See, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may be able to rejoice when they see your good works. Not see your doctrine, not see that you're saved by grace, but see your good works. Jesus wants, Jesus ascribes the light that is in the church Toward behavior. It's behavior that demonstrates light. Not belief. Although belief is important, isn't it? For there is no respect of persons with God. Now notice this equity here. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. So God's feeling is, oh, you haven't heard the law? I don't need the law to convince you of sin. And the reason is because he can judge those who do not have the law based on what it is that he himself has showed them. And this is pointed out um, actually in chapter 1. See, they, uh, they can't say, but God, you didn't give us the law like you did to Israel. God will say, well, it is now this is true. I did not give you the law and you did not understand. However... I myself showed you, when you were standing outside your house that day, that was me who prompted you not to strike at that man. I showed you what was wrong. And you did it. See, he doesn't need the law to find anyone guilty. 
And we see we one thing we like about the law, about the letter of the law, is that you can play with it and make yourself succeed or or, or whatever by manipulating it. But God disavows all that because he he tugs at the heart and he knows what he's put in your heart. See, and in that day when it comes out, and it comes out in court. And they'll say, well, wait a minute, you can't say you didn't know that. I myself told you. I saw to it that you understood this. So um, all arguments will cease in that day. Isn't that marvelous? You won't be able to plead insanity. You won't be able to plead insanity, right. <laughs> now, I want you to, um, well, let's see. Uh, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So which, whichever it is, you know, it, uh, whether we have the law or not is not as critical as we would like to make it. Now I want you to ponder verse 13, because verse 13 gives the reason why God judges this way. Now, I also want you to notice that this statement here is precisely the opposite of what apparently Paul teaches later on in Romans. And this is enough to tell us that when we go to appeal of where it is in Romans 4 or 5, that we cannot amplify what he says uh, later on uh, when it says... Um, why don't I see if I can find that? Uh, I didn't think to look it up, but um, where does it say in the next couple chapters that um, it's uh, it's the fact that you uh, believe and not the fact that you do? I won't take the time now, but the, it's it's coming. I, uh, I don't see just offhand. Let's not take the time. But I, I do want you to focus. I, I, I'm assuming here that you're somewhat schooled in what is popularly taught as Paul's attitude toward the distinction between works and being saved by faith. Okay? Because this statement in verse 13 is just the opposite. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. It's the behavior. And right behavior, right conduct, is holiness. And then it goes on to explain. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. That's, that's enough law. If they, by instinct or by just some sort of who knows what, how does this is, uh, do by nature, if they just by nature won't cheat their neighbor, then they are judged uh, as though they have a law unto themselves. And the reason is because they are actually acting out as though they had the law. And so it's accepted. Which uh, show the work of the law written in their hearts. Which is the New Testament, isn't it? I shall write their law upon the, upon the hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. And this shows us how important it is. Your sense of right and wrong is actually very important. Your sense of, whoops, this, this thing is accusing me. I, I, I really shouldn't be doing, I shouldn't be getting into what I'm about to get into. See, your conscience is accusing you. Or it may be excusing you. It may be saying, well, there's no problem here. This is all right. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. This is, uh, this, I won't be defiling myself. See, it's the conscience that either accuses or excuses, and that becomes its own law. And the reason why that, that this has the strength in the Gospels that it does is because your conscience is molded 
by the Holy Spirit. So your conscience is in God's hand, and he pricks it. He says, whoops, watch this. This, uh, this isn't right to get into. And you start thinking to yourself, well, mate, yeah, this isn't right for me to get into. So you're responding directly to the gospel. You're, so, you're responding directly to the New Testament. The writing of his law in your, into, your, into your hearts and mind. And it doesn't matter whether you have a book with it written down. That's not the issue. It's great if you do. It's helpful if you do. But it's not the sense of the gospel. Yes. And what about, uh, what about the was it Hispanic Jews? Uh, their moral conduct. Um, the Hasidic Jews. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh huh. Um, does that mean that they're saved? Well, I don't care to get into um, uh, that. We, uh, uh, if you'd like to discuss it uh, afterwards, the important factor about being saved is whether or not, and, and this is a question to test yourself with, and this is a difficult one for, for Christians, is Jesus the Savior? We have no trouble with that. Yes, he is. Can he save anyone he chooses for any reason he chooses? And we have trouble with that. And in so doing, we defy that he's Messiah. We defy that he is Christ. He's not the Savior. If he can't save whom he wants... For whatever reason he wants, if, if he has to bow to some doctrine or something written on pen and ink, we are denying Christ. And that's the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist denies Christ. It denies that he can save. The spirit of Antichrist says, well, he can only save if you do A, B, C, and D. And that's a murderous spirit. I rather would submit that yes, Jesus can save for whatever reason he wants to. He's the Savior. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to agree with it. None of that. I don't have to approve it. But he can do it. The thief on the cross is a perfect example. Sure, by him. Absolutely. Uh, see, we we are so gospel bound in a wrong sense that we have to jump through a lot of hoops to get Abraham saved, and it's clear that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to sit down in the kingdom and eat at that table. I mean, that is clear. It was Moses, Moses, and Elijah that appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. See, we we wonder. How did they get born again? <laughs> See, showing, showing our immaturity and our... It's like, you know, they, 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 they've crashed our party. You know, what? <laughs> so, but God can save Abraham, he can save Noah, he can save anyone he wants. And that is a better way of viewing the Lord. And as far as <clears throat> who he is going to have mercy on, he can have mercy on anybody he wants. And he says so himself. And so all, all arguments cease. Now unfortunately, what, what we would like is to see quite a bit of this mercy extended toward us. And that's, that's fair. Uh, the law came by Moses, it says, but uh, grace and truth and mercy came by Jesus Christ. And so we're, uh, we're in good territory there. But unfortunately, he calls us to something far greater than any Hasidic Jew or any in the Old Testament were called to. And we have Bible for that. And John the Baptist is the greatest 
of the apostles, the greatest of the prophets, sorry, greatest of the, of the uh, prophets. But he that is least in the kingdom is greater than John. So there is a decided sense that what Christ has called us to as what we call New Testament believers is quite grand and glorious and filled with such majesty and honor that it staggers our imagination. But we should not correspondingly relegate everyone else except us into positions where it is impossible for them to please God. They can please God based on what he chooses for them. So here's another way of asking the same question. Can God, will God have mercy on the ignorant? Will he have mercy on the ignorant? And that is no small question. If you say no, he will not have mercy on the ignorant, then you have joined the ranks of modern Bible-believing Christianity. If you say, yes, I believe God has mercy on the ignorant, then I believe such, myself that such an attitude is near the heart of God. And you see this all through the Gospels. Jesus gave consistently the, the hard time to people who knew better. And he had great patience and mercy toward those who didn't know. So that's how we like to characterize the Lord. Now, even though the Lord may have great mercy on ignorance, our goose is cooked because we are not ignorant. So we can rejoice in what God may help others in that regard. But unfortunately... <laughs> We're going through a curriculum ourselves. He keeps our feet to the fire, so to speak. Uh, we're required because he has shown us. He has shown us. So we can't plead ignorance. So much is given. to whom much is given, much is required. There you go. And what, what is the counter? What is the flip side of that, Ira, would you say? To whom little is given, See, unto whom little is given, little is required. And so God has to decide how little they were given and how little he requires. And if they, re if they were faithful with whatever they had, whatever glimmer they had, if they were faithful to that, I don't think God is going to be quick to discard it with anger and hatred. It just, there's no purpose to it. God's anger and hatred is toward the devil. See, the lake of fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not prepared for people. But unfortunately, many will join themselves because they refuse. See, they know, and they refuse. And that's a different question. So what about the person who knows and refuses? They are in bad shape. Bad, bad shape. Unless God has mercy, they are not doing well. Praise the Lord. But we can't compare ourselves at all to any of this because... Uh, our eyes have been opened, we, have, we see, and, uh, and we rejoice in that. And we do not consider it a hard thing for the Lord to insist that we behave as become saints. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to um, uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 6. Now, what I have skipped over here between Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 6 is Paul's reasoning as to why it is that the law does not have the power in present day as in the time of Moses. He, and he's reasoning with Jews here. And basically... He appeals to them on behalf of Abraham because Abraham didn't have the law and he was accepted of God. And so correspondingly, Paul extends that argument, neither do the Gentiles. They don't have the law and God can save them too. And what I'm uh, 
uh, what I, and we're out of time, so we need to pray. But what I want to do is to go through Romans 6, <clears throat> because Romans 2, certainly there is left no doubt in our minds as to the relationship between pleasing God and our, be and our behavior. And then here comes this other dissertation about that leaves the impression, if you're not watching, that somehow it really doesn't matter about your behavior. And then Paul goes right back to the very same argument in Romans 6 to close it down, to say, now look, uh, let's read uh, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we con continue in sin that grace may abound? Can you see how he, he knew exactly what logic Romans chapters 3, 4, and 5 would produce. He knew exactly. He says, oh, what are you going to say to this? That, that, uh, that we can continue in sin so that grace can abound. No way. No way is the next, uh, says God forbid here in the King James, but it means no way. And that's what we need. When we teach about the grace of God, we also need to teach people, no way does this mean that you can continue in sin so that this grace abounds. No way. It can't be done. It's, in, it's, it's inconsistent. In fact, it...